Over a decade on since it began, Gravity Falls still manages to reveal new facts and bits of lore about itself that you wouldn't normally expect. Like, for example, did you know that the Gravity Falls crew opened a bar in their offices? Or that there's actually three different retail versions of the standard edition of Journal 3? As cliche as it may be, in this video, we'll be going over some facts about Gravity Falls that you probably never previously knew about, or you already knew about these facts and now you're commenting about how I'm really late to the party and yada yada yada. Now, Gravity Falls facts videos and articles are pretty common. I mean, you've got videos out there with over 100 facts about the show. However, many of these videos contain facts that are pretty commonly well known, such as the fact that Dipper and Mabel are based off Alex and Ariel Hirsch, or that if you play the theme song backwards, you'll find a clue on how to decode the ciphers. Alongside that, many of these lists were made well before the show had even ended, or not too long after, meaning they're well over 6 years old now. And believe it or not, there's been a ton of new facts and trivia revealed about the show since then. So for this video, I combined a list of very obscure, lesser known, and discussed facts related to the show, as well as facts you wouldn't normally see those other channels talk about given their fandom nature if you get what I mean. And believe me, I made sure I wasn't repeating myself by going and watching as many Gravity Falls facts lists and videos that I could before starting work on this project. <laughs> so with that said, here are 20 obscure and lesser known facts about Gravity Falls. Number 1. There used to be gift cards for Tourist Trap. When Tourist Trap first aired, the episode was made available to download off iTunes for free for a limited time. Alongside that, in January 2013, Starbucks picked the episode for their pick of the week and customers were able to pick up a free gift card containing a code to redeem the episode on iTunes. I looked online and I found many old tweets from 2013 with people getting their cards. They were all listed as having an expiry date of April 2nd that year however, so even if by some miracle you found an unredeemed one today, it wouldn't even work to begin with. Number 2. Neil and Emmy Cicerega's dad is in a Gravity Falls book. Most Gravity Falls fans know already about how Neil Cicerega originally created two unused theme songs for the show and also made a couple of songs for the series such as Goat and a Pig, the unused It's Gonna Get Weird song, and Pine's 2016 song from uh, The Stanturing Candidate. Other Gravity Falls fans also probably know that his sister, Emmy Cicerega, was a storyboard artist on the show. But believe it or not, their father also had an involvement in Gravity Falls. In 2017, Don't Color This Book, It's Cursed was released. Written by Emmy, this was a coloring book for Gravity Falls and within it was this one drawing of Grunkle Stan cradling money like a baby. Drawn for the book by character designer Stephanie Ramirez, Emmy and Neil's dad dressed up as Grunkle Stan and posed for the drawing which Stephanie used as a reference. Number 3. There's a possible uncracked code in the Time Pirates treasure book. Dipper and Mabel and the Curse of the Time Pirates Treasure is one of my favorite GF books and arguably the most underrated of them all. It was a lot of fun to read and has many interesting little non-canon adventures in it on top of the canonical secret that we all know about. However, one aspect about it that still eludes fans, well at least some of them, is this. In this one outcome in the book, Dipper and Mabel return to discover that Grunkle Stan is now a reptoid. In his reveal, he screams this sentence. As per insulted of his crooks do as night time. They do a fleas and trucks and Of course, at first glance it looks like a code and some fans in the past have attempted to crack it. But none of the known ciphers used in the show work on it, and if it is visionaire, then we don't know what the key is. It's very likely it's nothing more than gibberish, but it's still strange that it's written the way it is, and definitely a clever red herring if that's the goal of it. I even reached out to Jeff Roy who wrote the book to see if he could shed some light on it, but he has not ever responded to my tweet still, so there's that. Number 4. There's actually lore behind Mabel's nightshirt. Whenever there's a scene in Gravity Falls that's set at night or early in the morning, Mabel will very likely be seen wearing her purple full sleeve shirt with a floppy disk on it. Given she wore this at night, it's actually made more appearances in the show than any other of Mabel's sweaters or attires being listed as having 10 appearances in the show altogether, and if you exclude her shooting star sweater's appearances in the theme song, it's appeared more times than it as well. While you may think it's just an interesting and random design choice with no real meaning, 
There's actually some lore behind where Mabel actually got it from. In an interview Alex Hirsch did with Comics Alliance in 2012, not too long after Gravity Falls began, he was asked about the shirt and revealed his thoughts on where it came from. He referred to it as a hand-me-down shirt like one of those big ones you'd wear to sleep as a kid that were never originally your own. In terms of where it came from, he reveals that Mabel's dad was once at a Windows 95 conference and was given the shirt as some sort of promotional merchandise, which he never ended up wearing. Eventually, he passed the shirt down to Mabel who turned it into her sleep time shirt. Alongside just revealing to us the lore behind the shirt, this fact also reveals to us one of the few things we know about the twins' parents, which is that their father worked in a computer-related field. Who knows, maybe he worked at Microsoft at the time and helped in the development of Windows 95. Number 5. Alex Hirsch used to respond to fan mail. In the early days of Gravity Falls, Alex was asked by a fan if there was somewhere where that they could send fan letters to him. Touched by the offer, Alex publicly released his Disney office address for fans to send letters to him. His reasoning was that he understood how important fan mail was, having sent many letters to Nintendo when he was younger too. Given back then the show was still new and had a small fandom, Alex didn't really think that it would become so big of a deal. Well, that changed very fast for when Gravity Falls began exploding in popularity, Alex's address got flooded with fan mail from fans who were discovering his initial address. He got sent everything ranging from letters, dolls, art projects, and even a coconut. Obviously, with the huge amount of mail that he was now being sent, Alex was never able to reply to all these letters and instead kept them safe in a storage locker, having read them on nights when he struggled to get through a deadline. So if you sent a letter to Alex Hirsch, even if you didn't get a response from him, chances are that he did read it. However, before Gravity Falls' total explosion in popularity, Alex did respond to fan letters. There are several instances online of fans showing off letters that they got from Alex in response to fan mail that they sent him. These response letters were personalized with Alex thanking them for whatever they sent and answering questions if they had any. He even would send merchandise for the show like signed posters and postcards. It's unknown how many of these letters Alex sent out, but luckily not that many given there's so few of them that I can find online still. Number 6. The Gravity Falls crew opened a bar in the Disney offices. Making a kid's show takes a lot out of you. I mean, Alex Hirsch has famously said that he was burnt out by the end of season 1 of Gravity Falls. It took a lot of perseverance, hard work, and insomnia to make the show. Plus a lot of booze. And for the Gravity Falls crew, it was all in-house. In 2014, as production on season 2 of the show was well underway, the Gravity Falls crew opened a bar in their offices at Disney TVA. Called the Drunkle Stan, which I'm pretty sure you can guess who it was named after, it was the perfect hangout spot and place to unwind after a long day of working for the mouse. There's a ton of old photos online of the crew hanging out in it, drinking, playing bar games, and just chatting around. The drinks served at the bar were also Gravity Falls themed. For example, there was a drink called the Fuzzy Mabel, which I'm pretty sure was not the kind of drink that Mabel should be having until she's at least 21 years old. Or 19 if she lived in Ontario, or 18 if she lived in Quebec. Why is America's drinking age so high compared to other countries? That was a rhetorical question, please don't actually answer that in the comments below. Number 7. There's a Grunkle Stating Sim. I'm not even joking about this one. This is actually a real thing. Back in 2018, as the Gravity Falls fandom was getting hyped about the release of Lost Legends in the box set, a group of fans released an unofficial Gravity Falls game, which was a dating sim for Grunkle, Stan, and Ford. Created by several well-known names in the fandom, including Kiki Kit, who provided sprite art for it, the game walks you through a pretty well-crafted story in which you get to date either Stan or Ford. Believe me, I know, given I actually played a bit of the game back in 2018 when it came out, just to see what it was like for a review I was making for Gravity Falls Amino back then, given back, back in those days I was a blog writer on that app. It's surprisingly well made, and has a very well done story as well as some really well made artwork and character building. Alex Hirsch even played the game back in the day during a live stream with Darren Nefsey and Dana Terrace. So yeah, the creator of Gravity Falls himself has attempted to go on a date with his own creation. It's about three hours, three hours. to complete. Good lord! Good lord. Let's click through it a little. I, I want to. I want to. I want to get to one. I want to see one chest hair. We're gonna. We're gonna. I would to, like to see a single chest hair. We're gonna hair. see this door drum. To a oh. tough choice. Excuse me. Oh ah. Oh, oh. oh my. Ah. 
Maybe Bella is such a cockwalk in this situation. Maybe get out of here. Maybe don't do something. I think she is very much rooting for this situation. Um, and she wants to make it happen. The game is still available to download and play, and I'll leave a link to it below. Number eight. There's three different versions of Journal Three. Now, when I say there's three different versions of Journal Three, I don't mean versions in the fact that there's the standard edition and the special edition. I'm talking about three different versions of the regular version of Journal 3, the one without black like pages and the one that most fans probably own. There's been three different versions of this book that have been sold online and in stores since it was released in 2016. While these versions do not contain anything new or different in them in terms of content, there's minor differences on each of the book jackets that can determine which one is which, with some potentially being more valuable than others. Now, this here is what the first version of Journal 3 looks like. At first glance, there doesn't seem to be anything different about it, and if you're a longtime fan, it, you might even own one. This was the original look of the book when it was released in 2016, and the one people who pre-ordered it received back then. Eventually, the book became a New York Times bestseller, resulting in the addition of this little bit that tells you it's a bestseller on the cover. This is the version of the journal that is still sold to this day, with most of the older versions sold before possibly being considered more valuable due to their covers being more visible and the fact that they were the first editions of the book published. But I mentioned that there was a third version of the book too that was sold in stores. And it's this. Journal 3 Signed Edition. Not Special Edition, Signed Edition. This is the most valuable retail version of the journal because, as the name suggests, they're signed by Alex Hirsch himself. See, back in 2020, Barnes & Noble sold a bunch of these books as part of their Black Friday sale. Alex didn't publicly announce these books, given at the same time the GF Vinyl was also announced. So these books sort of had a low profile release, with only a few fans knowing about them. I managed to get a copy for myself through a tip on my server, and it's one of the best things I own in my collection. I'm also glad I bought it when I did, because not too long after, they sold out, and they've since been seen being resold on eBay for prices that's near special edition levels. And speaking of the special edition, number 9. There's actually 10,001 copies of Journal 3 Special Edition. Originally meant to have a 1,000 copy release, demand and popularity led to Journal 3 Special Edition instead having 10,000 copies made. And today my choice not to buy one in 2017 for financial reasons continues to haunt me whenever I see one sell for over $2,000 on eBay. Yeah. But while 10,000 copies were officially made and sold, there's actually one more copy out there that isn't as well known. See, back in 2018, Alex Hirsch took part in a charity event on the H3 Podcast. I know, bear with me on this. Anyways, podcast choice aside, the charity event was to raise money for recent wildfires in California, and as part of the auction happening on the stream, and also probably so that the only things available for grabs were not just Rick and Morty merchandise, given Justin Roiland was also on the stream, Alex brought one final Journal 3 Special Edition to give away. However, this was not one of the original 10,000 copies made. This was the prototype original special edition. It was the first test printing of the book that was made to see if it could even be done. As Alex put it, it was the first, first edition. As it was a test version not meant to be sold, it has no number, so it could therefore be classified as being copy 0 out of 10,000. But regardless, it's the oldest and most unique copy of the special edition that's out there. And it was also the most bid for item in the charity stream, raising over $12,000 on its own. Exactly who ended up winning it is also unknown, however. What's more, it's unknown exactly what was inside the journal that was unique compared to normal special editions, though Alex has said that the book likely contains typos, so whoever was the lucky soul who won it, I hope you don't find too many spelling errors in it. Number 10. Canada was first to know about Lost Legends. Gravity Falls Lost Legends was officially revealed by Alex Hirsch on July 14, 2017, during a panel at D23. However, a few fans actually knew about the book's existence nearly a full day before, myself included. It all began when a Redditor named MeleeLover64 posted about finding an unknown newly listed Gravity Falls book while shopping at Canadian bookstore chain Indigo. For you non-Canadians out there, it's basically our equivalent to Barnes & Noble, to put it simply. The post barely got any attention and was overlooked by most people. However, I saw it and posted about it on all the social media platforms I was active on at the time. 
The title of the book was in Caesar cipher and decoded to say Untitled Mystery Book. It was also revealed how many pages would be in it, and the release date was listed as July 24, 2018. The description also said that all would be revealed at D23, meaning this was very likely not an early leak by Indigo, but a planned one for fans to come across and help promote the D23 event. And well, we all know what happened next. Though most fans would end up learning about the graphic novel from the official reveal by Alex and his tweet later in the day, me and several other fans already knew about the book before it was officially revealed. And given at the time the book had not been made available for pre-order on other sites like Amazon or in the United States, this meant that Indigo was the first place fans could order the book from, making us Canadian fans the first to be able to pre-order it, on top of knowing about it first as well. Number 11. Disney once gave out Gravity Falls press kits. Prior to the show starting, Disney sent out a bunch of custom-made press kits to help promote Gravity Falls. It's unknown exactly how many were made, but as of 2022, we only know of the existence of two of them. There was a special Disney Channel exclusive press kit that arrived in a wooden crate and contained inside of it a Gravity Falls branded bag. Inside the bag was a Polaroid camera with film, DVDs with information about the show, a t-shirt, and more. A now deleted Redditor posted photos of it as they were given the kit from a friend of theirs who worked at Disney. Another version of the press kit was given to a journalist in South Africa. His press kit came in an evidence box with the journal Two Hand on it, inside of which was a mini camera, evidence cleaning brush, a magnifying glass, a flashlight, DVDs, and more, as well as press info on the show. Given these kits were only given out to members of the press, they were never available for fans to buy. The US press kit was actually sold on eBay apparently, but besides it and the South African version, none have ever surfaced. The mystery of GF is actively looking for one to buy, so if you know someone who has one, let him know. Number 12. There's a missing Seuss commentary. When the Gravity Falls box set was released in 2018, fans got to enjoy the commentaries from Alex and the rest of the crew on every single episode. Alongside the normal ones, there were three hidden commentaries for three different episodes. The first extra commentary was by Jason Ritter for Devil Dipper, which involved him and clones of himself. The second was an extra commentary by Grunkle Stan for Land Before Swine, which is also the most well known of the three given it was what helped start the theory that Ida from the Owl House is Stan's ex-wife. And the third extra commentary was done by show composer Brad Breek for Not What He Seems, in which he talked about the episode's OST. However, as it turns out, there was a fourth secret commentary made for the box set that wasn't used. In 2021 on the third anniversary of its release, Shout Factory producer Antonio Lopez made a thread on Twitter about working on the box set and revealed among other things that he had recorded a fourth hidden commentary with Alex Hirsch voicing Seuss, which is not used for unknown reasons. So like the Stan one, it was a character doing commentary for an episode. I reached out to Antonio about if he still had the audio, what episode it was meant for and if there were plans to release it. He told me that the commentary is still likely in the Shout Factory archives and that given it was never approved by Disney, it's unlikely to ever be publicly released. He also mentioned that it would have been on the same episode as the Stan commentary, that being The Land Before Swine, which was a surprise to me given I assumed that it would have been a Seuss focused episode that the commentary would have been for, such as Blendin's Game or Seuss and the Real Girl. Either way, the Seuss commentary remains locked away and unlikely to ever be released. Number 13. The Gravity Falls crew very much knew about Dipper Goes to Taco Bell. So, uh, I wish I was making this one up, but the evidence out there supports it. In case you're a lucky fan who doesn't know about the context of this, long story short, Dipper Goes to Taco Bell is the name of a very infamous Not Safe for Work Gravity Falls fanfic published in 2012 by a very sick-minded fanfiction.net user. It got taken down not too long after, but has since gone on to become a sort of messed up meme in the fandom due to how gory the story was, and still gets talked about to this day, with reposts always being out there. Seriously, if you're tempted to read it, do not. I know me saying that won't stop some of you, but just know that some Gravity Falls fans out there have been genuinely traumatized by this fanfic to the point that it ruined the show for them. But anyways, it's always been a long-standing question in the fandom as to if Alex and the Gravity Falls crew knew about the story given how much they kept track of fandom discussions back when the fanfic first started spreading. While there's been hints to suggest that the Gravity Falls crew knew about it, such as statements Alex has made in the past to a possible reference to it in an actual Gravity Falls game, the definitive proof was recently rediscovered. The first bit of proof comes from the long-defunct Tumblr blog of Gravity Falls animation editor Andrew Sorcini, aka Mr. Babyman. 
In a Tumblr post he made a mere two days after the fanfic began exploding in popularity, he stated the following, quote, Yes, the Gravity Falls crew is painfully aware of the Taco Bell challenge. Later, when asked about if the Gravity Falls crew had read any fanfics, this was what he said. Not typically, but that one was making the rounds. While not stated in name, of course, he pretty much confirmed that the crew very much knew about it. Oh, and if the, that doesn't get you to believe it so far, then let me show you this. It's an actual comment made by Michael Rianda on a post about a student film of his on r slash videos in September 2012. Yeah, the crew apparently held a public reading of it. Uh-huh. And as for Alex Hirsch, well, remember how I said in Fact 5 that he used to respond to fan mail? Well, a Tumblr user posted in 2016 about how they still have the letter that they got from Alex in 2012, and in it, they mentioned that they asked Alex if he knew about that fanfic and well, this was his response. So yeah, you be the judge of this one. Number 14. Grenda's canonical last name is Grendinator. Moving on now to something that's not disturbing, we're now going to talk about Grenda. Although in the show we don't learn it, according to the Gravity Falls wiki, Grenda's last name is Grendinator. Now, of course, one has to obviously consider that this might just be a troll, given anyone can edit these pages. But in this case, a source is provided. The source links you to the old Tumblr blog of legendary Gravity Falls fan artist Sailor Leo. Among other things, she was the creator of the Reunion Falls AU, which in my opinion is one of the most incredible, most fun, and wholesome Gravity Falls AUs that are out there. Anyways, the link takes you to a post in which she talks about how she spoke with Alex Hirsch at the Farewell to the Falls art show in 2016 about if he knew what Grenda's last name was. He had no idea and let her come up with the name. She chose Grendinator and he declared it canon on the spot. Now we can be certain that Sailor Leo did meet Alex, given she both confirmed she did and the dates matched the day Alex was at the art show. Plus, she was one of the artists who contributed for the show, so it's very much likely she did meet him. Now of course, given this was just said by Alex at random, whether it's canon or not is more so up to you. But if you can say in a random tweet that Wendy's middle name is Blurble and the fandom accepts it, I think this can be too. So yeah, Grenda's full canonical name is Grenda Grendinator. Number 15. Three Gravity Falls characters were voiced by kids from Make-A-Wish. Founded in 1980, the Make-A-Wish Foundation is a non-for-profit organization that helps fulfill the wishes of children with critical illnesses, such as cancer. These can range from meeting famous or powerful people, getting to visit somewhere special, or giving the child the chance to do something they've always wanted to do. For three kids, that wish was to be part of Gravity Falls. In the fall of 2013, during production on season 2, two kids named Nicholas Eiler and Micah Amundsen visited the show offices and got to meet the cast and crew, including of course Alex Hirsch. Both got to look behind the scenes of the show, get early previews of it, and contribute to the production with Nicholas getting to make edits for an episode with Matt Braley and Micah getting to pitch ideas that they had to the writing team. On top of that, both got to voice characters in the show that were based off of them and named after them. Those characters would end up appearing in the episode Seuss and the Real Girl as background characters. Make a Wish and Gravity Falls would team up again in March of 2015 when they welcomed another kid to the offices. Following her successful cancer treatment, Georgia Gillespie got to visit the GF offices and meet the cast and crew. According to an article Make-A-Wish made on her story, Gravity Falls helped her and her family bond and get through days as she battled a rare form of liver cancer. On top of meeting the people who helped make the show that got her through those tough times, she also got to voice a character designed by her. Officially known in show as Girl with Bow, the character appeared in the background of the Stanchurian Candidate after Stan's first successful speech. They love me? Stan, 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 Stan. To add to this all, in December 2021, Georgia donated all the royalty payments that she made from her parents on the show, an amount nearing $2,000, back to make a wish, so that they can continue to grant the wishes of other children battling serious illnesses out there, just like they did hers. Number 16. Gravity Falls made a cameo in Private Practice. 
You all know about the Gravity Falls references in animated shows like Rick and Morty, Amphibia, and most recently The Simpsons, but Gravity Falls has also made appearances in some live action shows as well. One rather overlooked minor cameo occurred in the medical drama series Private Practice. In the third episode of the show's sixth and final season called Good Grief, two of the characters, Cooper and Mason, are eating cereal and watching cartoons. And take a guess what cartoon they were both watching. You're crazy. He's obviously a vampire. A vampire that eats nothing but chocolate. Tony is a freaking tiger. He would maul the count and eat him as part of his complete breakfast. No way. As you saw, they were watching Gravity Falls. More specifically, the beginning of Headhunters. Good Grief came out on the 9th of October, 2012, so a little over three months after that episode first aired. Given Private Practice was an ABC show, and ABC is of course owned by Disney, it's very likely this was an intentional easter egg in the series, likely to help promote the show. Though I'm not sure how successful it was given you don't see too many people talk about this cameo, or see that many Gravity Falls fans were also fans of Grey Anatomy spin-off series. Also yes, I get how hilariously coincidental it is that the character's name is Mason and they're watching Gravity Falls, which you'll understand if you've read Journal 3. Number 17. Gravity Falls food was once actually sold in real life. In 2014, Wikia, now known as Fandom, which is home to the Gravity Falls wiki page, launched an event called the Battle of the Fantasy Food. The event was a series of polls in which people could vote for their favorite fictional food items from various famous franchises. The catch was that whichever four foods made the final rounds would end up being made for real and given out at the first ever Wikia fantasy food truck at that year's New York Comic Con. Alongside other famous fantasy foods like the Krabby Patty and the Golden Apples from Minecraft was Smile Dip. So there was a chance that the hallucinogenic candy that sent Mabel on essentially a drug high could be made for real. Eventually Smile Dip made the finalist rounds securing its place on the food truck but it also went on to win the event completely. Sure enough, that October, people attending New York Comic Con were given the chance to try Smile Dip for real. The version sold that the event was slightly different to the one in show, being a shortbread that was quote, dipped in a tangy pink glaze and a pink sugar crystal tip. It kind of looked like Walter White's Met if it was made by Mabel, but nonetheless, it was a hit and people loved it. The following year in 2015, Fandom held another round of polls for people to vote on which fantasy food would be at that year's food truck. This time, the Gravity Falls food in the running was Mabel Juice. While it ultimately lost the final round to Nuka Cola from Fallout, it did make the final round and thus secured its place in the food truck for another year in a row. While unlike the in show Mabel Juice, it didn't include plastic dinosaurs, likely due to health and safety reasons, it did contain gummy worms and was another hit at that year's event. Finally, in 2016, Fandom hosted the third and final iteration so far of the food truck with the same rules as before. This time around, the Gravity Falls food in the running was Pit Cola, and like in 2015, while it lost the overall victory to Yole Cake from Battle for Dream Island, it did secure one of the finalist rounds, making sure that it would be made for real, and so at the 2016 New York Comic Con, people got to try Pit Cola for real. Since then, there hasn't been another food truck by fandom at NYCC, but if they ever do so again, might I suggest cheese boodles or chip hackers. Number 18. The original design of the gnomes was much creepier. When Dipper finds Journal 3 in the first episode, one of the very first pages we see in the book is the gnome page. And when you see the gnome drawing that Ford made, it's pretty unusual looking and somewhat makes the gnomes look a lot less scary. However, in a very early promo for the show that only seemed to have aired once from what I can find, the gnome drawing had a different and creepier looking design to it. From what I've been able to find, the promo in question was aired just a few minutes before Tourist Traps premiere in 2012, and luckily, that promo was recorded and saved, and I will now show it to you. Gravity Falls is a mystery to Dipper and Mabel. Until... Whoa! Uh, what you reading? Some nerd thing? A hidden journal... What is all this? ...reveals the clues. Sup? Ah! Norman is not what he seems. You think he might be a vampire? Shabam! As you can see, the drawing here looks definitely a lot creepier. The gnome in the promo is smaller looking, has more menacing looking eyes, sharp teeth with a really creepy looking smile, and just all around looks a lot scarier. Ironically, this design looks a lot closer to what the actual gnomes were like when we see them later in the episode. Except 
Exactly why this design was not used in the actual episode is a mystery. Though, if Alex's recent videos about the emails he got from SMP are anything to theorize off, it's very likely that they made him change the look of the gnomes at the last minute out of fear that they may get complaints about it being too scary. I know it's crazy, but then it's Disney as SMP and they're just that dumb. Who's to say how this made up poem ends? How could anyone complain about something that's only in their heads? SMP still feels that fucky would come from ducky. Who should I call to have this conversation personally? Yet somehow this design slipped through the cracks and was still used in these early promos. And this wasn't the last time it was seen either. In 2013 when Gravity Falls' first DVD release titled Six Strange Tales came out, it included in it a mini replica of Journal 3, with a few pages from the book ended that were seen in the episode, including the gnome page. And take a look at what version of the gnome they used in it. That's right, somehow the original gnome design made it into this booklet of all places and was seen by every person who bought that DVD. While the design was not used in the official Journal 3, it's still funny to think that out there there is official Gravity Falls merchandise that you can still buy that has it. Though, given now we have the box set, buying Six Strange Tales is a pretty pointless purchase. Number 19. There were never originally plans for a third season. Gravity Falls Season 3 is basically the Half-Life 3 of cartoons at this point. Some swear to this day that it's going to happen and will dissect anything Alex Hurst says in hopes of finding some subliminal message in it that hints at when Season 3 will be coming out. However, we're not interested in that, but rather a misconception that often gets passed around about Gravity Falls, in that a third season was always originally planned. While I know most of you know this to not be true, I'm still going to include it as a means to help educate newer fans about it as I'm sure many probably don't know where to find the proper information given how obscure it is. The misconception is that Gravity Falls originally was going to have three seasons, but that it was cut short with the third season becoming Season 2B. The reasonings for this can vary from Season 2B feeling a bit more like its own season rather than the second half of Season 2, though that's not really that uncommon nowadays given we have shows like Amphibia which have really different themes and feelings to them in their first half of their season. So for example like Season 3 for example of Amphibia was, the, the first part was very different feeling to what the second part of Season 3 was. So it's not all that big of a deal nowadays. And on top of that it's also the fact that in his Reddit AMA from many years back, Alex said that he wanted to do either three seasons or two seasons in a movie, and given we never got a movie, you can assume that he chose the three season option. Though that's also not really that true because Weird Mageddon is considered the movie in this case. However, this is all the basis which has led to some people believing that the show was cancelled as well. All of this of course is untrue and can be proven in two different places. First of all is Alex's defunct Tumblr blog on which he announced that Gravity Falls was going to be ending back in 2015. He makes it blatantly clear in it that the show was not cancelled and that he was ending it as per his own choice, and that there were no plans ever for a third season. On top of this, in 2018, Alex was talking about how he had a burnout while working on Gravity Falls and cleared the air once and for all in a reply about rumors related to a season 3 and if one was ever originally planned. To quote him, he says, No season 3 was ever written, outlined, or mapped in any way. There were debates about how long the series would be, but by mid-season 1, I knew it wouldn't be more than two seasons. He went into further detail about why there is still so much made up misconception and lore about season 3. Quote, The reason there's so much invented lore about this is that I wasn't allowed to announce that S2 was the final season until very late. It took fans by surprise and in lieu of info peeps were like, maybe Alex's writing hand was caught in a bear trap or something or there was a warlock's curse. I've trained fans to search for conspiracies so well that when I give them real news, they always try to rearrange the headline into a conspiracy. It's my fault really. So realistically speaking, the reason there is so much made up lore about Gravity Falls Season 3 being real is not because Alex was forced to merge it with Season 2, but that there was never one to begin with and that the shock of the show ending because of him announcing it so close to the finale made it harder for fans to accept the facts creating these invented ideas that are still spread around to this day. I think this is why in turn Matt Braley announced that season 3 of Amphibia would be the last one all the way back in 2020 as season 2 was underway during his Reddit AMA. This was probably a means to prevent the same issues that Gravity Falls had in that waiting too long to say that this is the final season will create a belief that the show was not ending naturally but was cut short and it was some sort of cover up to hide the real truth that the show was cancelled. 
And it's pretty much worked too, given there's not really any um, Amphibia fandom lore about there being a fourth season or that the show was cut short as there is with Gravity Falls. So it does work to let your fandom know earlier on that the show is ending, so that way there isn't this crazy um, shock that Gravity Falls fans had about their show ending. Number 20. Gravity Falls fans helped save Confusion Hill. I've saved this fact for the end as it's a very wholesome note to end on and just shows how special and impactful Gravity Falls is beyond just its 40 episodes and 17 shorts. If you're a longtime fan, then the name Confusion Hill will likely be familiar to you, but if not, let me quickly explain what it is. Confusion Hill is a roadside attraction located in the Pacific Northwest, specifically Northern California. Like the Mystery Shack, it's filled with all sorts of gimmicks like optical illusions, strange statues, figures, rides, food, and more. It's as close to a real-life mystery shack as you can get, and for good reason. Alex Hirsch was heavily inspired by Confusion Hill when designing the mystery shack in the early days of Gravity Falls' production. Him and the crew even visited the place in 2013 during a road trip called Mystery Tour, which I have a whole video about. In 2016, Confusion Hill was the location of one of the clues that fans needed in order to complete Cypher Hunt and find the Bill Cypher statue. This is also where many of you probably know the story from my upload of that box set clip in which Alex famously mentioned how Bill was arrested by the Reedsport police after a land dispute. Confusion Hill generously took the statue in and made it a permanent attraction there, making it a sort of pilgrimage location for Gravity Falls fans to visit and take pictures with him. Anyways, fast forward to 2020 and the world is going into lockdown as the pandemic rages on. As you may remember, many small businesses struggled during this time, and some would never sadly recover. Confusion Hill, like many small businesses and roadside attractions in that area, relies heavily on tourists to keep itself going, and especially after the winter season, making the time of lockdowns even worse for it. With no one coming, and as spring arrived, the attraction's future lay in question, with the risk very much being there that it could be shut down forever. A GoFundMe was set up to help raise $9,000 USD, the amount needed to help cover losses for the, at least the three months of lockdown, pay the employees, and fund much needed repairs. I was made aware of the fundraiser from someone on the same day that it began and I did my best at the time to help spread awareness of it. In the description of the GoFundMe, there is a mention about Gravity Falls and how fans of the show will know Confusion Hill for its influence on it, and well, it seems the fandom very much took note of that and never forgot how this little roadside attraction helped save the Bill Cipher statue and gave it a forever home. Because what happened next was nothing short of incredible. It took one tweet by Alex Hirsch, one tweet, and the fundraiser took off the next day. Milestones began being reached in no time, and with the combined help of Gravity Falls fans, former visitors, and organizations close to the tourist attraction, the goal was not only reached, but exceeded, securing Confusion Hill's future. Today it still operates as it always has, and Bill Cipher still rests in the trees, watching as fans come and take photos with him, waiting for the day the pines once again come out to play. One sunny summer's day. But with that said, those are 20 obscure facts about Gravity Falls that you probably never knew. It's crazy honestly how even a decade on from its first episode and years on since it ended, Gravity Falls still continues to provide a ton of new content and trivia for us to discover. And what I've just told you here is only a drop in the bucket. If you look around, you're bound to find all sorts of obscure facts and trivia about the show that will continue to blow your mind. You can take the fan out of Gravity Falls, but you can never take Gravity Falls out of the fan. And so long as there are new things to always learn about Gravity Falls, it will not be dying or leaving irrelevancy anytime soon. But with that said, we're at the end of this video. This has been a That GFN Presents video, and thank you for watching.